Hey, Jody here. This video is going to be a slightly different format. I'm doing a little Q&A today from the last video on TIG welding cast aluminum. Had quite a few questions come in. Some questions are hard to answer in text and easier to answer if you can clip in little sections of video. So that's what I'm going to try to do today so that you just don't see this talking head for the whole video. All right, let's, let's hit the first question. Peter Welder says, did you use 4043 filler rod for this video and 3XL outdoors? What what rod did you use for the filler material? Um, here's the thing. On the actual part, I use 4043 because basically that's an okay choice for a casting like that. And that's all there was in the shop that day. Now, a couple days later, I went to my local welding supply and scored some 4943. It's a fairly new alloy that wets out a little bit better. It's really good for castings. And so I got a few pounds of sample of that and I took it home and I mocked up some sections for the thicker areas of that casting. And on the actual casting, like I say, I used 4043 filler. Before I ever added any filler, I used the cleaning action of the arc and just walked it back and forth. This is what I would do on any aluminum casting, whether it's oil soaked or salt water soaked or whatever. I would let that cleaning action of the arc bake a little bit of that crud out first before I started trying to add rod in there. Then I would just add just a little bit of rod and I would use minimal heat and I would use a forward and back motion. I wouldn't necessarily add rod each, each motion because right now it's reluctant to flow in there. Instead of adding amperage or rod, I'm just going to wait a minute. There, it flowed and I'm using minimal heat and I'm not pulling out a whole lot of crud underneath as what's in most castings. Auto Talon asks, slightly unrelated to the video, but I'm disabled and unable to use a foot pedal. Is there a TIG torch that has a trigger instead of a pedal? There is. There, there are several options for torch triggers and torch amperage controls. I just happen to have a few. Uh, so let's take a look at them right now. Right, the ones I have are CK Worldwide, and most of them strap with Velcro straps to your current torch. They do have them also where it's built in, but this is a north-south slide amperage type thing, and it, it's kind of hard to get it to get it started. It's got a little bump on the plastic, and to get the arc started, you have to push it kind of hard, and that's going to move the torch around. So you could probably make some adjustments there to where that worked. Maybe just smooth down the bump with a, a file or something. But once it's going, it's pretty smooth, but it's just kind of hard to get it on. Let's take a look at another one real quick. All right, this is a rotary track style, again, from CK, and it's got little knobs on it, and you can use your thumb or your finger or both, and that kind of can be a benefit. This is going to take a little getting used to. Again, it, it Velcro straps onto your torch body however you want it, and you can, you can rotate it around where you can run it with your finger or with your thumb or both, and you might have to move it for different type applications. It's not bad. It's just going to take a little getting used to. It's pretty smooth. The on-off is fairly smooth. Uh, just nothing beats a foot pedal. Let's take a look at another one. All right. Now, this is a spring-loaded little rotary control here. And I kind of like that idea because when, when my helmet's down, sometimes I forget which way is hotter and which way is colder. But this way, all you have to do is release tension, and it backs off on the amperage. It doesn't have much of a stroke on it. But my experience with these hand controls is you kind of set the machine kind of hot so that you don't have to uh, move your finger several times to increase amperage. And you have to just really be careful with your motions on your finger. But one little stroke of half inch might mean 50 or 100 amps. But I kind of like this one. All right. Jasper Chavis or Chavis has a comment on die check. If you didn't see the video, let me show you exactly what he's talking about here real quick, and the, the, the comment will make a lot more sense to you. Uh, to identify exactly where the crack ends, I used uh, a die check set. So it's cleaner, penetrant, and developer. And this is the die check. You let it stay on there for quite a while, and then you clean it off. Just wipe it off with the cleaner material in a rag, and then you spray this white chalky substance on there. And then the red dye will bleed on out and usually let you know exactly where your end of your crack is. And in this case, I stop drilled the end of the crack with about an eighth inch uh, drill bit. And then I could look on the inside of the part and see if I completely reached the end of the crack. All right, what, here's what Jasper says. I can't buy that leak check in my area. 
So what I use is some kerosene with food coloring mixed in a spray bottle. And along with some Dr. Scholl's Athlete's Foot Spray, which is a chalky powder kind of a spray, works like a charm. <laughs> Who is this guy? I like him. Now, if you're doing coded work, you know, stringent applications, critical work, you need to use the, the certified stuff, the leak or die check liquid penetrant stuff. But uh, just for a quick info, like what I did on this part to identify where the end of a crack was to help you make sure you get it all out. I'd say give it a shot. <laughs> Where's this guy been? <laughs> Chopper Dan, 88. Jody, are you going to Fabtech in Vegas this year? This will be my first year there. Love to meet you if you're not already swamped with a line of other folks who want to do the same. I am going. I, I sure am. And uh, I usually go. In fact, over the last 25 years, I, I don't think I've missed more than a couple. And uh, I just think it's awesome. If you're, if you're all in welding and you're really interested in this stuff, you can make it to a Fabtech. Uh, it's great. Now, what is Fabtech? Fabtech is North America's largest welding and metal working uh, trade show. And you can see anything and everything to do with welding and fabrication and metal working under one roof. Not in just one day. It really two days to do it justice. But one day is worth it if that's all you have. You might even run into somebody famous like that guy. I just, I really have a good time going. I get demonstrations on all kinds of different products, things that you even haven't even heard of yet. But here's the awesome part about Fabtech is the networking, meeting people, talking to people, talking to reps, getting demonstrations of products that you basically can't get, you can't see anywhere else. And being around a bunch of like-minded people who are interested in what you're interested in is an awesome thing. So yes, I'm going. Here's probably what I'm going to do. Uh, I'll send out a little a little message either on a uh, YouTube video through if you're on my email list you'll get it uh, on Instagram and I'll probably set a little schedule like on on the first day I'll be at the Lincoln booth from this time to this time second day I'll be at the Miller booth from this time to this time third day strong hand tools booth or something like that and that way if you want to come by and shoot the breeze talk welding that would be great I did that last year I hung out at the Lincoln booth for a while I did have kind of a kind of a crowd talk to a lot of people. It, it, I enjoyed every minute of it, especially the students. Uh, it's very, uh, very encouraging to hear that I'm helping somebody. So I hope to see you there. Rob Schrader asks, uh, what machine and amperage settings were you using? So I was, I was set to about 175 and I was using the foot pedal and sometimes I was full pedal and sometimes I was not. In fact, there have been times I might have even had the machine set max, but I was using a foot pedal. So I'm guessing right here I was uh, about 130 or 140 on this thin, roughly quarter inch thick section. And uh, I was washing it forward and back using minimal heat. And I'm doing that on all this stuff. This is the thick section, different machine, but same settings. This one I'm using 49-43 filler metal. The previous arc shot you saw I was using 40-43. Both of them work just fine. I really like the 49-43 though. And that reminds me of another question. Just what is my favorite filler rod for aluminum castings? I like this 49-43 rod. I haven't done enough welding and enough testing on it to, to know that it's going to be my absolute favorite for aluminum castings. But previous to ever trying that, I really liked 40-47 aluminum filler rod and the reason is is because it's got a lower melt point. It's got 12 percent silicon which lowers the melting point and makes it really fluid. It really wets in. What that does is now you don't have to use much amperage to just wet it over the surface and you don't pull out contaminants from underneath the surface that you have in castings. I'm doing a little testing here on 49-43 versus 40-47 so here's an example of the technique and how I just wash that metal and how the 4047 just kind of flows in there. It's uh, it's pretty liquid, pretty flows ahead really easily, but I'll do some testing comparing it to other alloys shortly. The Mixmaster Mike 1000 says, asks, what does rot material mean? Um, when I said it, it sounded probably like rot, like something is rotting. What I meant was rot. W-R-O-U-G-H-T, and all that means is it was wrought, it was formed either through rolling, forging, or something like that, as opposed to just being cast in a mold, and that's it. When you, when you form something, 
through uh, a mill and a roll and all that, it squeezes those grains and makes for a more compact grain structure and typically elongated grains. And that's rot. That's what rot material is. So it's, if it's not cast, it's usually rot. Brineberg 22, I'm going to call it. When will the app for the Android be out? Now, uh, if you've been paying attention, watching my videos, I released an app called Share My Weld. To start with, is for the iPhone because that's what my son Joey was familiar with and he could get that going first. Now he's working on the Android version of that. So what is Share My Weld? Let me, let me take you through a quick preview. Basically, it's a way that you can take a picture of a weld that you're really happy with, record the settings easily with drop-down menus, filler metal, amperage, all the settings used and all that, and then record it. And basically, you've got a pocket library of, of your welding procedures that you, you want to recall maybe two or three or five years later, a job you did. Oh, I see. I was welding four inch schedule 40 and that worked awesome. And here's what it is. Boom. So let me, let me show you that real quick. All right, one thing you can do, obvious thing is you can access the videos that I make every week through the app, but the main purpose of it is to be able to record settings sort of like you have a procedure library in your pocket. You select the process type, select the metal type, the thickness, uh, the details, it's going to take you to cup size, gas flow rate, filler metal type. It just prompts you through the course of things so you don't forget anything. And then when you get all that stuff inputted, you have the option to either keep it private for yourself or share it so that other people can benefit from your, your, your hard work too. So here you select public or private. No pressure to do either one. And uh, if you select public, it'll share it to other app users. There's other app, uh, other options also to share it to Facebook or Instagram. But I don't know how many people are going to do that. It doesn't matter. This is just whatever you want to do. So when you select uh, that public or private, you put the caption in there. You, now you have a pocket full of welds that you are really happy with and you want to save the settings for. We're working on the Android version of that. I, I saw a lot of people posting pictures of welds and then people would ask, hey, what settings did you use on that? And then they'd have to go type in all that stuff. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you, you could just do that really easily? And if you could do that really easily, maybe a lot of people would participate and share that information back and forth. And if you don't want to share it, no big deal either. It's, you, can, you can select private and all that, as you saw in the, in the preview there. So it's, it's in the works and uh, Joey's working hard on it. Mix Master Mike 1000 again says thanks for the knowledge, and I just ordered an AHP Alpha Tig yesterday. Looking to get a Tig finger. Is it better to start with a regular or XL? Should I buy from you or Amazon? Um, buy from me or Amazon. Be careful on Amazon. There's some knockoffs. They're using. They're even on eBay and Amazon. They're using my images, and then at the very end, they're using their inferior product, and then they're even using Weldmonger in the description. That's a heck of a thing, isn't it? Uh, but anyway, uh, two, two guys chimed in on the YouTube comments and said, get both. So their words, not mine. <laughs> you saw me using the, the XL in the video, and, and I, th I hope you can see that it's just obvious. Like, I could find a 4x4 a, a four four block of wood and prop my elbow and get in there and everything, but I didn't have to even, even uh, take a break. I just went from one weld to another. I propped right on the weld I just did with that XL, and uh, fingers never got hot. So it's kind of nice to be able to prop wherever you want to. All right, so before I let you go, there's something else I'm working on right now. It's called the Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast. You can listen to it on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, several other places. It's me, Roy Crumrine, and Jonathan Lewis, and we get together. It's a weekly podcast. We talk topics on, we talk about welding topics, just like I did today. It's just like this, except in a podcast form. So if you like this kind of thing, I think you'll enjoy that. We have a topic every week, and then the next week we interview a guest. We've had several guests on so far. You know, a guy that builds monster trucks, a guy that does heavy equipment repair, a guy that does high-end aluminum welding, a, a machinist welder does prototypes for bicycle parts. I've been having a lot of fun doing it. I've been learning a lot. I think you will too. So it's Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast. Take a listen. We'll see you next time.